Welcome back, everyone, to episode 22 of True Words, a Shingon Buddhist podcast. I'm Reverend Kosho Finch. As always, thank you for your many questions and topic suggestions. Today's topic comes from a listener question, and it involves Buddha nature. So I'll talk a bit today about this concept. It'll probably help to first to define this idea, and then we can explore a bit more about its importance in Buddhist practice. Different Buddhist traditions have described this concept in various ways, but all with a goal to both inspire and inform the practitioner of their goal. Sometimes described as a seed, which, if properly nourished, grows and matures into Buddhahood, or even an embryo, imparting the idea that this nature needs proper care, nourishment, and feeding until it is brought to maturation. Just like a child, it is susceptible to injury and influenced by its environment until it can stand on its own. Various Buddhist sutras discuss this concept. Perhaps first announced in the Queen Tramala Sutra, which I'll leave a link to in the text in the description of the video and on our blog for this podcast episode. The text is one of the first that discusses the Buddhist concept of emptiness and this aspect of sentient beings to become enlightened that upon freeing ourselves of wrong view, of ignorance, of the obstacles that we have placed between ourselves and the enlightened mind, that this intrinsic nature is revealed. So the Buddha nature is something within us that can be developed through spiritual practice, or perhaps correctly stated in Buddhist terms, something uncovered through spiritual practice. Buddha nature is considered to be present in every sentient being, not just people. As I've mentioned in the past, Buddha nature is a concept that is much larger than the format of a podcast allows us to fully explore. My hope is that if the concept is new to you, you'll explore a bit more. And if there is interest, we can revisit the idea in a future podcast. First, it may help to discuss a little bit about human nature. There's a long-standing philosophical question. Are humans basically good, basically evil, or something else. What part of the human are we developing through spiritual practice? Generally speaking, in Buddhism, ethics and moral behavior are not the end goal of spiritual practice, but rather the the foundation for that practice. When we look at the actions of people, we are programmed to see the bad more than the good. There are a million little good things happening all around us all of the time. However, When this is disturbed, we more clearly and immediately see the bad things. Building gratitude toward life is so important. Seeing and magnifying the good in ourselves and in others. Seeing it happen in each and every moment and in little ways and being able to take joy from it is truly a gift. This is its own meditation practice in Buddhism. From the four foundations of mindfulness, we learn the importance of sympathetic joy. In many ways, You can see this reflected in the Japanese Buddhist ethic of gratitude. This concept is literally baked into Japanese culture after hundreds of years of Buddhist practice. For the most part, however, these are superficial manifestations of our personality, our upbringing, our social and political reality at the time. Wherever we see war and conflict, we can also find a time when that area was peaceful, or looking at a peaceful area we can look back in history to find a time of strife and suffering. Often our opinion of human nature is based on the events of the time or the evening news. I mention this because Buddha nature isn't like a soul or true self or finding some secret key that will make you more successful in business, sports, or a host of things that the modern mindfulness movement is often marketed toward. Human nature is also malleable. This is one reason why the imagery of plants is so often used in Buddhism. Where we compare the spiritual growth of a human to that of a lotus, something that can grow straight and beautiful and rise above the mud. We also have to be aware that without spiritual practice, without some ability to look inside of ourselves, our environment and our education can produce good or bad results. This is also another area where we should be careful not to oversimplify Buddhism into meditation only. Often, Buddhist practice is relegated to only silent sitting, 
without some guidepost and proper foundation, this meditation can become anything we dream up. Rather than squander an opportunity in practice, one reason to study Buddhism, in addition to a meditation practice, is to have a better understanding of the aspects of the mind that we are exploring. We may think we understand the obstacles along the way, but as I learned when I began studying this teaching, and as I continue to study this teaching, both the Buddha's instructions and the experience of cultivators before me have contributed greatly to what I would call my working reference handbook of information accompanying my practice. So let's look at the issue of human potential. Sometimes we quickly make statements such as all religions teach the same thing ultimately or all paths lead to the same goal. While generally true in terms of ethics and moral conduct, we should investigate each spiritual system independently as the reason for suggesting such conduct may vary greatly and be of tremendous importance to the overall content of the knowledge expressed in a particular spiritual system. For example, killing. Most all religions teach that killing should be avoided, but is there an exception? Is it taught that killing is bad because the founder of the religion declared it so? Is there a specific instance of killing mentioned in the teaching of that system from which we can more deeply learn and understand the effects of our, of our actions? In my experience, each system provides a different perspective on this and other issues. And, as part of our human wisdom tradition, are important to study and not overly generalize or dismiss as being the same or limited only to moral conduct. It is possible to understand Buddha nature as a convenient title for a potential, a potential that all sentient beings have of becoming Buddha. Buddhism has, throughout history, utilized various methods of describing this potential using a variety of metaphors. So is it there inside of us waiting to be uncovered? But how is it uncovered? Buddha nature may be best understood through the Buddhist teaching on emptiness, which itself may be best understood as interdependence. Much of Buddhist practice is aimed at developing this sort of wisdom, where we have a deep insight into the nature of reality, of our senses, our mental process. As we strip away all of the ideas we have about ourselves, what we can and cannot do, what is and isn't possible. This fundamental concept in Buddhism, impermanence, is both an encouragement to practice, to understand our minds, and to solve this mystery of this puzzling thing called life, and to draw us closer to this idea of Buddha nature. Buddha nature may still seem elusive. Why does it require the development of the Buddha's wisdom? Because it requires us to see beyond our normal day-to-day -day distinctions. Is our nature fundamentally good, fundamentally evil? This is still a type of dualism, an inherent conflict where we favor one over the other, or where we are liable to turn our back on one for the other. We want good, but don't want evil. Yet a state where we cease distinguishing between the two is hard to comprehend. Sometimes I give the example of two toddlers playing together. They are still learning to share, so they may not want to allow the other to play with the toy. This conflict causes stress and emotions to arise between them, and things may become physical. The parent or teacher doesn't label one good or bad, or their actions naughty. They are simply seen as unhelpful. Perhaps they are separated or redirected, but one isn't good and the other bad in this scenario. Wise parents, more often than not, smile at their petty squabble and look forward to instilling virtue within them. So if we say Buddha nature is neither good nor evil, what is it? So next it may be helpful to investigate a little bit about the relationship between humans and Buddhas. The point of practice, going far beyond stress relief, reduction, bodily sensation, these types of goals, and moving towards approaching our true mind. Buddhism has spiritual practices in part to weaken our conditioned thinking, our very strong sense that we are right, that things absolutely are the way we think they are. The only way to invite in a different reality 
to understand things from a different perspective is to break down these self-imposed barriers. Generally speaking, humans don't like change. If you have a pet, you will know that they really prefer rigid schedules and don't like that deviation. Sometimes we chuckle at this, but really we aren't much different in this way than an old cat. For a human being, however, so often we are averse to change because that also means changing our ideas. The more settled in our ways that we are, we will deny reality and even facts. I've especially seen this over the last 10 to 20 years as rules requiring holders of broadcast television licenses in the United States to present news in a manner that was honest, equitable, and balanced. Today, we may see the same story presented on different channels in dramatically different ways, each channel with a different group of viewers, and those viewers then holding dramatically different perceptions of the same events. If one group attempts to change the mind of the other, there's tremendous resistance. The more we practice, the more we break through these strong aversions to change, the more our wisdom is developed, and the more we draw closer to our Buddha nature. Not as something hiding inside of us, but as a potential that we have for enlightenment. When I first learned about Buddha nature as a potential, the first thought that came to me was potential energy. And I was reminded of the image used in grade school for this concept. That of a boulder resting atop a hill at the edge of a cliff. The boulder had all of the solidity, heaviness, and mass. But due to its proximity to the edge of the cliff, it also had the potential to roll down the hill with awesome power. That rolling and power are not inside the boulder, but that power can be achieved through the removal of the material standing in the way of the boulder and the cliff edge. For each of us, the quantity of material and obstacles to be removed may be different. Buddhism is a teaching about the nature of those obstacles and contains a host of tools and methods to remove those obstacles. As we get into the process of removing that material, we may find that the boulder sits more deeply into the earth than we thought, and there were other more deeply set stones in the way. We may rest atop the boulder and see the surroundings differently than before. The Buddhist teaching describes all of these experiences and more, but that potential is there for all of us to complete the work, to free that great stone. Buddhism has some key differences from other religious traditions. Take, for example, the beginning of Buddhism. The Buddhist teaching began in the human realm, not in heaven or mythical realm. This may lead us to conclude that Buddhist teaching is solely the domain of humanism. We see elements that are distinctly human, distinctly relevant to our human experience, and then we may reject other aspects of the teaching. Throughout history, we can see the tendency of humanity to shut out certain ideas and more narrowly define human behavior, thought, or potential. A teaching that leads us to look inside, to examine our own minds, and foster such inquiry never goes out of style, will never not be needed, and especially as technological advances increase the pace with which we advance, communicate, and make decisions will be ever more relevant. We shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that Buddhism doesn't encourage goodness or that it announces a radical anarchy. Of course, Buddhism supports ethics, morality, and goodness, but not as the end goal of practice, rather as a foundation for harmonious relationships. In Asian nations, prior to the arrival of Buddhism, there were philosophical systems that we can say were not religious, but which announced ethics and morality. These can exist without religion. So Buddhism has to offer us something more, something unique, not only the same ideas repackaged. Building on a foundation of morality and providing a teaching of looking inward is what Buddhism offers and which is something truly unique in the history of wisdom tradition. As always, thank you for spending time with our podcast. If you listen on YouTube, please like and subscribe to our channel leave a comment or question for future topics. And as always, we offer you our gratitude.
Thank you.